Please rise and join me in the call to worship. <clears throat> Give ear, O oh my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. Tell your children and your children's children that they should set their hope in God. Let us worship God. Hymn number 2236. Scripture reading is Joshua 24, 1 through 3a, 14 to 18, and 23 to 25. Then Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel and said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Long ago your ancestors lived beyond the Euphrates and served other gods. Then I took your father Abraham from beyond the river and led him through all the land of Canaan and made his offspring many. Now therefore, revere the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your ancestors served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. Now if you are unwilling to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods, for it is the Lord our God who brought us and our ancestors up from the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery and who did these, those great signs in our sight. He protected us along all the way that we went and among all the peoples through whom we passed. And the Lord drove out before us all the peoples, all the Amorites who live in the, who live in the land. 
Therefore, we, we also will serve the Lord, for he is our God. Then Josh, Joshua said to the people, you are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen the Lord to serve him. And they said, we are witnesses. He said, then put away the foreign gods that are among you and incline your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. The people said to Joshua, the Lord our God we will serve and him we will obey. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and made statutes and ordinances for them at Shechem. The second reading for today is from Matthew 25, 1 through 13, waiting for the bridegroom. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like this. Ten bridesmaids took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five of them were wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. They, as the bridegroom was delayed, all of them became drowsy and slept. But at midnight, there was a shout. Look, here's the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all those, all those bridesmaids got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. 
But the wives replied, no, there will not be enough for you and for us. You had better go to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they went to buy it, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went with him into the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the other bridesmaids came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he replied, truly, I tell you, I do not know you. Keep awake, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour.
Our gospel lesson today is imploring us to prepare diligently, to prepare thoroughly to meet the groom, our Lord Jesus Christ. Us, his followers, the church, being the bride. Traditionally, back in the day, the bridesmaids would illumine the way from the bride's home to the groom's. The bride would go to the, bride, the bridesmaid's parents' house for the ceremony, and then the feast would happen at the groom's home. And so the bridesmaids would have their oil lamps to guide the wedding party to the feast. The only thing I can liken it to, because I'm so used to lights whenever I want to turn them on, street lights, is maybe when I was a kid, we used to go to the movie theater and an usher would guide you in with a flashlight so you're not tripping over people on your way to your seat. Or uh, more recently, about four years ago, I had the chance to go on a uh, study trip to Peru, where we spent time in the headwaters of the Amazon. And we were a day's journey from any infrastructure whatsoever. And one particular day, uh, the boat trip to our jungle lodge took a little longer than expected, like four hours longer. So we were well past sunset and were squinting, looking for any clearing along the riverbank to where the jungle lodge would be that we were to stay. <clears throat> Thus the need for light. So some of the, some of the um, bridesmaids were prepared in case there was a delay. They took extra oil with them. The others thought it would be a short-term assignment, and they only brought the oil that was within their small oil lamps, no surplus to fill their lamps. So Jesus said, that's something to think about in preparation for his coming in fullness. So whether it's the second coming of Jesus, or whether it's our own eventual death, which uh, we don't know when it's going to be. How often do you hear of somebody who dies unexpectedly? Uh, maybe they were perfectly healthy and boom, an aneurysm or something. Or somebody's in the hospital, they're doing really well, they're about to be released, and something unexpected happens. We just don't know the day of our own physical death, and thus also the need to prepare to meet the bridegroom. So the scriptures urge us to take personal responsibility to put to use the spiritual gifts that God gives us. In the Old Testament lesson, Joshua challenged the people Choose this day whom you will serve. A servant in the day was also a slave. You are completely at the whim of your master. Happily, when we make Jesus our master, he's a benevolent master. And so that's a good service. So we, when we say yes to serving our Lord Jesus, putting ourselves completely at his disposal, is a win-win. It's a win for the kingdom of God. It's a win for us personally. And when we say yes to that thorough preparation for the meeting of the bridegroom, it translates into serving our neighbor. And that's especially important for us to think about as we look to be God's servants in healing our nation and in healing all the nations. So the question for us to think about is, 
Do we live foolishly or do we live wisely? So lack of preparation, lack of responsibility, lack of preparedness takes several forms. The first one, well, in no particular order, but procrastination, maybe later. We might do that with our service. We might do that with our giving to God. We might say, well, someday when I'm in a better position financially, I can plan to uh, give the first fruits to God rather than what's left over. Think about the times you may have had an exam and you didn't prepare well for it. And so you're just praying the morning of, Lord, help me to do well. Well, if you knew in as much time as everybody else knew, you would study to be better prepared because God gave you an amazing brain with which to prepare for an exam. So the uh, piece that Alyssa just played, you probably didn't just sight read it or look at it the night before. Uh, that, that kind of putting together of music takes some preparedness. And I want, I want you to think about preparing a musical selection the way you would prepare your life spiritually for when our Lord comes in his fullness. You don't wait the night before the concert and say, well, what am I going to play? Have I ever played this piece before? It takes a little bit more diligence than that. Another form that lack of preparedness takes is a sporadic observance of public and private worship. So think if you only occasionally attend to your personal spiritual life, if you only occasionally attend to your public worship, how would that be if you treated meals that way? Well, on Chris, it's Christmas, I think I'll have a meal. Well, it's Easter, I think I'll have a meal. Well, you would probably be malnourished or you wouldn't be here. And spiritual hunger is very much the same way. You just don't feel it in quite the same way. What if your refrigerator ran about as sporadically as you uh, operated your spiritual life? What if it just sometimes ran? It wouldn't be much of a refrigerator. What if your car sometimes started and sometimes not? You would say it's not a very dependable car. And so it is with our spiritual life. Always be prepared. It, two appointments ago at the Beach Lake Church, we started a community garden. And I got to see some first-time community gardeners. Some of them were diligent. Some of them understood what they were getting themselves into. Others, not so much. I remember with some amusement watching a young family. Uh, the mother brought her kids and she's going to town planting all these seeds. The kids are running around spraying each other with the hose and got all the seeds planted, watered. So that was in May. Didn't see or didn't see anybody in that family till the end of August came back to a garden full of weeds, and they were dismayed. Where are my crops? What are all these weeds? How come it didn't just happen? Because she didn't do diligence. My uh, applied music teacher in college used to say to me when I would show up and clunk my way through my lessons, he would say, my friend, let me tell you something about your practicing. I'm guessing that when you practice, you start at the beginning of the piece and you play through to the end. A to Z. A to Z. And you're wasting a lot of time playing the parts you already can play, and you're not 
spending time isolating those passages that need the extra work. Absolutely right. Moreover, he said, you're not paying attention to beginnings and endings because when you start a piece, if you're not confident and you mess up within the first couple measures, even if you play the rest of the piece beautifully, your audience is going to be tense because they know it just like didn't go well from the start. Or if you play the whole thing beautifully and the end's a clunker, what are they going to remember? The end. Practice. Difficult passages, beginnings and endings. Don't waste your time. Wasting time is another way that we are not preparing to meet the bridegroom. Attitude is another way we don't prepare to meet the bridegroom. Someone else can do it, right? You know of a need, someone else will step up to it. Or I did that when I was younger. It's someone else's turn. Or sometimes we're out of balance with our faith. So the, the passage today, uh, or even you know the Joshua passage about anticipating going into the promised land, or Jesus' parable about the bridesmaids, both are about anticipating, forward-looking. So if your faith is so fixed on the second coming of Christ that you're not living in the moment, then that's an unbalanced faith. It's, an un, it's not preparing well to meet the bridegroom. Maybe it's a bit like Tuesday night where you stayed up too late watching the election results coming in, and Wednesday you're kind of groggy at work, right? But you still keep sneaking a peek at how the numbers are coming in, and Thursday, and all you can think about is the numbers coming in. That's how it would be if you're so focused on the second coming of Christ that you're not thinking about the work that you have to do here on earth, the work of loving neighbor. That has everything to do with preparedness to meet the bridegroom. When I lived in Wilkesbury, I sometimes would go into a, a lock and key place to get a key copied, uh, and they had a big sign in there, your lack of preparedness does not constitute an emergency on our part. So in other words, don't expect us to drop everything we're doing, you know, to like give other customers the shaft because you did something dumb. So there's no quick fixes. There's no spiritual quick fixes. Spiritual preparation can't be bought or borrowed at the last minute. I like to refer to the law of the farm, which is something coined by Stephen Covey, who used to train Fortune 500 companies. Think about planting a garden, preparing the soil, sowing the seeds, watering the seeds till they germinate appropriately weeding around the seeds so they don't get choked out, fencing it off if you have a deer problem, using some diatomaceous earth if you have an insect problem. I mean, there's, there's lots of things that need to be done along the way. It's called the law of the farm. You don't plant string beans at the end of August unless you live way down south, then that might work. You don't plant something when the ground is frozen. That's just the law of the farm. You know, it can be cold if you're planting cold weather crops, but don't go try planting corn in April. It just doesn't work. It's the law of the farm. It's how things operate. So there's no shortcut or quick fixes there either. That's how it is with cultivating your spiritual life. 
think and act. Think and act. A musician needs to know the score. Sometimes you practice better by just sitting, looking at the score without the instrument. Say, oh, I didn't realize that that's a 30-second note instead of a whatever. Or I didn't realize that note repeats or something. Um, you're a little more observant when you take the time to ponder something. If you're going to plant, read the seed packet. How long does it take something to germinate? How long to full maturity? What's the planting depth? You don't just rip open the seed packet and away we go. What's the spacing? That's no different from cultivating your spiritual life. It takes some thinking, some meditating, some planning. What are you trying to accomplish? How does your life need to mature in order to attain to the spiritual level you're aiming for? How do you need to look more like our Lord? When I was in high school, I was a high jumper, and I, I managed to attain some success in it. But a lot of my success was not just out there building myself up physically or doing the actual practicing. A lot of that was the time I spent thinking about how to get over that bar. I thought my way over it probably more than I physically practiced it. A basketball coach told us when I was in, on the ninth grade team that a study was done, two different groups of professional players, uh, group A and B. Group A were told, I want you to practice foul shots. Group B, I want you to think about foul shots. And then we're going to see how you do, you know, group A corporately, group B corporately. The group that thought about it did better than the group that just did it. Because what if, what if you're doing something incorrectly and you just keep doing it over and over? You're training your brain to do that thing over and over. It's the same way with your spiritual life. So you could get up in the morning, say your prayers, read your upper room, read your Bible, check, 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 check. But what stops you in your tracks? What confronts you? What makes you think about your life? That's where sometimes we need to slow down and meditate a little bit on our spiritual life, not just do the time. How do you do the time? In October, I played for a friend's wedding. I played guitar, and I hadn't played some of these pieces in years, folks, years. But I had agreed to do it. Phyllis said, do you think you could do it? You only have four weeks. I said, I think I can do it. First thing I did was make a list of the pieces that I thought were pretty well etched in my long-term memory, like the muscle memories mostly there. And then I started playing through them. The ones that my tendonitis left arm just wasn't going to overcome in a month, ditch those pieces. I know I'm never going to have the arm strength in my left hand to do that. The ones that I could muster through, isolate the passages, folks, just like our spiritual life. Preparing to meet the bridegroom sometimes means taking small chunks and analyzing them and making improvements. Now is the time for us to fill our, to 
fill our lamps and to keep them burning and to make sure that we have a reserve. In scripture, there's, there's different words for time. One is chronos, that's chronological time. Tick, 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 hours, minutes, days, years, that's chronological. Kairos is a different kind of a time. It's the now moment, right? It's when God says, for the Lord, uh, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years are like a day. That's kind of all to God, part of Kairos. When you're at a traffic light and you know it's red, if you time, the, if you do a stopwatch from the time it turns red till it turns green again, that's chronos. That took 45 seconds. But sitting there watching that red light, anticipating it turning green so you don't get the horn blown behind you, that's kairos. You're in the moment, you're focused on it, you're ready, you're not on your phone, right? You're prepared. Kairos. Because there's an Ionios. That's eternity. So in God's economy, we use the chronos of our earthly lives to live in the Kairos, the God moment, because God is with us every moment, aware that God is eternal and that we are made as eternal creatures as well. So we look at the big picture and use what time, and we don't know how much time, but we know we have this time, right? We know we have this kairos right here, right now. So that's how we act. That's how we prepare for the long haul to meet the bridegroom. Yesterday, I was in the office for a couple hours. I had ridden my bike in, and Phyllis was also going to bike to town. And I was thinking, well, maybe she'll stop in. So I was looking around my office. Does this office look like I would like it to look if Phyllis stops in? Well, it didn't, so I put some things away, tidied it up. It turns out she didn't show up. But I was able to focus better because I wasn't distracted by things that didn't need to be laying out and about. I had organized and prepared for how I was going to spend the time, and it was much more productive. We don't know when our Lord is going to show up. We don't know when our earthly lives will end, but we should always be prepared. If you're a restaurant owner, you should always be prepared for the inspector to come, you know, make sure your place is clean and up to code, right? Same way with our spiritual life. Cultivate your participation with other people at Asbury, right? It's not just about worship. Remember, in scripture, worship and work are the same word. They have the same root word. Be intentional, be consistent, offer yourself to God in service. That'll translate to service to other people. Prepare now, now, this Kairos moment for the wedding feast with every aspect of your life. The time is now to choose living wisely rather than foolishly. The time is now to live as citizens of God's reign. Amen.
Tuesday, after I had voted over in the section of town designated, I came to the church here at Asbury, and it was shortly after nine o'clock, and because you had said yes to Asbury being a polling place, the place was buzzing. There was a line down the hallway outside there were poll watchers. Some had come from Washington, D.C. Some had come from Baltimore. Others, I'm not sure where they were from. But all extending hospitality. And as I marveled at the neighborhood coming to our door on this day, I thought, why just this day and why not many other days as well. And I thought about the many ministries of hospitality that Asbury has. And of course, it, it was just a great day to really pray for the people who came through. Um, in fact, the election judge asked me to pray for and with the uh, poll workers, which was a real honor. And I learned shortly after arriving that there would be a need for interpreter, for a Spanish-English interpreter. And I wasted no time giving my cards out to the election judge, the poll workers, the poll watchers. And I spent quite a bit of my day interpreting for people, which was a real honor as well. So it was a good day, a good oppor opportunity, and I think good reason for Asbury to rejoice that you allow yourself to be a ministry center in this community. Also, you may note that in your announcements, the, uh, the slots for the hospitality desk are filled. That's great. But some of the folks are duplicates. You'll see the names of people more than once per month. So that's an indication that we can always use more folks. If you prefer the 11 o'clock service, you would be uh, invited to sign up for the 9 o'clock. That way you don't have to miss 11 o'clock, and you get to meet some of the folks coming into 9 o'clock. So please consider that, and Lynn will sign you up. We want to continue to pray for the health of our community, our county, our state, our nation, the world, as we hear of increasing uh, test results for people with COVID. So I certainly pray for your safety and health and well-being, as well as for all people. We pray for a peace, 
wonderful transition in leadership in Washington, D.C. and in other places around our country as uh, incumbents are defeated by their challengers. Uh, I pray that we can be sensitive to how people feel and that we can be in ministry to and with all people everywhere. Please note in your announcements that this coming Wednesday at 7 o'clock is our annual church conference. That's where major decisions are made for the coming year. So if you're a member, that means all members can vote. It will be in person in the MEY, or if you prefer to attend online, you can email uh, Lynn Smith in the office and she will send you an attachment of the material so you can follow along and even vote online. Also, you will note uh, Paul Stambach's Bible study, Tuesday morning Bible study. Uh, even though this was a bustling place this past Tuesday, I was able to sneak in some time uh, with uh, Pastor Paul's Bible study. It works very well via Zoom and uh, good participation. And if it's something that you feel you would like to uh, be a part of studying the Gospel of Mark with Reverend Paul Stambach. Please uh, email his daughter according to the instructions in your bulletin. Let us be in prayer. God of mystery, God of time, time as we understand it, time as you understand it. God of red states and blue states, God of all nations, God of all people. In the aftermath of our national election, we know that some are grieving and others are rejoicing. Help us as your followers to neither gloat nor despair. Heal our way forward together. Soften our hardened hearts. Inspire us to justice, kindness, and humility. We want to be prepared and ready to celebrate with you. We want to be ready for your surprises. Cure us of our need for immediate gratification. Grant us an active patience as we eagerly live into the fulfillment of your kingdom. Lift us up from our lethargy and set our feet on your path once more. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear, hearts to hope, and the willingness to serve you and all your people. We pray this in the name of our Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ, who taught his disciples to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. <laughs> Heaven's from
As you go forth, may Almighty God keep you vigilant and wise. Go in the peace of the Lord, and may God help you always to be faithful. Amen. We will serve the Lord.